Oh, good afternoon. I, uh, I was told I'm supposed to tell a little of my story of how I got here, um, which is really a story of collaborations with a number of other fabulous people who had complementary expertise, uh, who I learned a lot from uh, in many different fields. I want to uh, distill a little bit of advice. Uh, since uh, I've noticed other people doing that, and then I'll get to my main topic, which is to talk about social nudges for health behavior change. So a little bit about my story. I uh, got a math undergraduate degree uh, from the University of Michigan. I went to grad school at MIT in computer science. Uh, while I was there, I, I started in artificial intelligence. I finished in HCI, which didn't really exist at the time, but uh, I did it anyway. Um, and even during the uh, PhD program, I started making collaborations with people from other fields, which was the primary way that I learned the things that I needed to from, the, from these other fields. Uh, the, the first was uh, in community development uh, uh, from Mel King. I, I was very interested in uh, technology-mediated social participation, although we didn't have that name for it. Um, back then, I. Uh, after I decided artificial intelligence wasn't really the right thing for me after my master's thesis, I went around to uh, nonprofit organizations around Boston and I said, I'm getting a PhD in computer science. I'd like to do something good for the world. Could you tell me what I could do that would help you and I could get a PhD from? <laughs> and uh, uh, they all said, well, we could use a membership database. And I said, I don't think I can get a PhD for doing that. Um, but uh, Mal King actually did have some ideas around um, uh, connecting people uh, through technology. Uh, I ended up thinking about trying to use the, the technologies that people had in low-income neighborhoods in Boston at that time was touchtone telephones. And uh, did my thesis on groupware by telephone, things like event calendars and uh, people uh, Craigslist, uh, but all with just touch tone and, and voice recordings. Uh, I collaborated with um, a guy who was working at one of the phone company labs who, who actually knew how to conduct experiments and, and knew how to do human factors research on how to make things usable. Uh, that was Bob Bursey, and so I ended up, what I got a dissertation for was not the community development stuff, but how to make audio interfaces uh, more usable. After I, after I graduated, um, the first uh, piece of work I did after that was on collaborative filtering. And that came out of a collaboration I formed with John Riedel. Um, we actually met at a conference, at the CSCW 92 conference. Uh, we're inspired by a keynote talk there. He knew distributed systems, and even though I had a degree in computer science, I didn't really know uh, things like how to make things scalable. And, and things like that. So this was a, a really helpful uh, collaboration, uh, and this was our paper from 1994. Maybe some of you have, have uh, seen it before. Um, sort of one of the, the first the things that launched recommender systems as a as as a as a field. A little bit later, I collaborated with uh, with a legal scholar, Larry Lessig. Uh, actually, this came out of I had done some technical work. Uh, he had stood up at a conference and said it was terrible, uh, and, uh, and actually, no, he said it was the devil. Uh, and uh, and uh, so we uh, did the academic thing of sitting down and figuring out what we agreed on and what we didn't agree on. It turned out in a 30-page you know, uh, law review article, 29 pages were things we agreed on, and one page we put, laid out the, the disagreements. Yes? Can I ask what the work was that you were doing? Oh, it was uh, work on internet filtering, the, the platform for internet content selection. It probably, I mean, it didn't really get adopted, but it, it got a lot of publicity at first, and so um, it got noticed. I, I um, collaborated with a couple of computer scientists over the years. The first, Bob Putnam, and, and very recently, uh, Brenda Nyhan, who's a uh, new assistant professor at Dartmouth now. Um, I don't have results of the work with Brendan yet to, to report. Uh, Bob Putnam invited, uh, how many of you have heard the um, book Bowling Alone? Well, that was Bob Putnam. Uh, he was responsible for making the term social capital be known outside of academia. Uh, and he convened in 1997 
a group called the Saguaro Seminar on Civic Engagement, people from a bunch of different uh, areas, and their job was, our job was to um, figure out how to reverse declining civic participation in America. There are a bunch of, that's Bob Putnam on the left there, that's me in the center, somebody else famous in the back there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what we did was we sat around at, at about a bunch of meetings, uh, yeah, we're all looking a little younger there, um, and, and uh, talked about what could happen in politics, what could happen in the arts. I was the technology representative in this group, uh, and I was supposed to think of how technology could reverse declining civic participation. So I was supposed to invent that. <laughs> I didn't. Um, other collaborators, um, uh, several collaborators I've had in economics, uh, the, in the long, for the long, longest running collaboration with Richard Zeckhauser, he was actually, uh, remember Alan Friedman yesterday at, uh, at Brookings, Richard was Alan's thesis advisor, uh, and, and so we, we did a, a couple of papers. One, uh, we did a field trial on eBay, seeing whether selling items under an identity that has a positive reputation is uh, helpful to the seller, as opposed to a new seller. Uh, and so we had the you know, first real confirmation that, yes, having a good reputation on eBay does help your sales. Uh, we also have done some more theoretical work, in, including this peer prediction method, how you can get, uh, give people incentives to honestly report their, uh, their sub subjective opinions about things when you won't ever have a real ground truth. You only have other people's subjective opinions. So for Kevin, for his uh, getting people to label things where you don't have a real ground truth. Uh, another economist, Eric Friedman, again, sort of game theoretic modeling I did with him around uh, the social cost of cheap pseudonyms. If people can keep coming back to internet forums, internet online communities under different IDs, what does that do to the ability of reputations to, to regulate behavior? Uh, in recent years, I've uh, worked with a computer science theorist um, on how to make recommender systems be resistant to manipulation. And we've found both positive and negative results. That is, you can make them provably resistant to a certain kind of manipulation, but you have to throw away a lot of information in order to do that. Uh, starting in about 2003, I, I started working with social psychologists, uh, Bob Kraut and Sarah Kiesler, especially Bob Kraut. Um, we had a big project between uh, economists, computer scientists, and social psychologists across Michigan, Minnesota, and Carnegie Mellon. This is one of our team photographs. There's Bob Kraut on the right, Sarah Kiesler in the middle, me with some facial hair. But also uh, others you might recognize, Joe Constant, Lauren Trevine, John Riedel, mostly obscured in the back. Here's Yan Chen, who's one of my economist colleagues. Uh, some of the students on that project, maybe you've gone on to notice, uh, there's Dan Cosley in the back. I know one of Dan's students is here. Uh, Maura Burke, who just went off to Facebook. So. Uh, Th that's the thing that Mark Smith was referring to at the beginning uh, of work I've been doing on uh, how to motivate people to contribute to online communities. Uh, out of that project came a book that just came out this, this spring. Have any of you, how many of you have seen this book cover somewhere? It's okay. very good. Jenny says it's very good. I think she even says that on the back cover. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope that it'll show up in courses that you might take. Uh, so that's, that's my trajectory. And to summarize, some of, of course, not everyone will, will take the same trajectory, but here's what I, uh, what I would distill from it. Uh, one is to collaborate with complementary experts. Don't collaborate with people who are just like you. Who bring, bring something, collaborate with people who bring something different to the table. And then don't just have them do the thing that you can't do. Learn what they know as you do it with them. Which I would summarize in the second point is go deep into these fields that you're crossing over into that you've got a collaborator who's, who can teach it to you. Don't just accept a, a surface understanding when they say, you know, I'm doing this equilibrium analysis. Figure out what equilibrium analysis is. I did back in 1997 or something, and it's turned out, turned out to be quite useful to me in, in many other 
places. When I collaborated with Bob Verzi on human factors things and you know, learned what a Latin square design was for experiments, that turned out to be useful to me in many other settings. And you know, now, I, now I can even serve as, as the expert who tells somebody else about that. So go deep into these fields that you cross into, but you don't necessarily have to be broad. That's where uh, you, can, you can rely on your, on your collaborator to tell you the things that you're missing. Uh, I, I know many of you, I can tell from the various comments and the affiliations that many of you aren't going to like this, but um, learn math and programming. Do, do one more than, 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 than you think you can possibly stomach in terms of courses uh, in that in grad school. You will not regret it. It'll keep coming back to help you. Uh, you, won't, you won't get everything you need. I, I keep learning new stuff uh, in statistics and things um, through the years, but it's a lot easier to get it that in grad school, uh, and it, that's stuff that's uh, harder to pick up uh, on the fly uh, from just reading somebody's great book about a theory or something. Uh, and the last thing uh, is a few thoughts, uh, basically an encouragement. This won't be for everybody, but to think about uh, taking a design perspective. And let me elaborate on that. There's this, this was going around Facebook a little while ago. I, I liked it so much that I put up here. Theory is when you know everything, but nothing works. Practice is when everything works, but no one knows why. In our lab, we combine theory and practice. Nothing works, and no one knows why. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I do think you can um, combine theory and practice. There's a little wisdom from Kurt Levine, two, two nuggets. One is that there's nothing so practical as a good theory. If you want to actually make a difference, have a theory about why things work. And go the other way. If you want to understand something, try to change it. So I would sort of distill that as understanding and changing things go together. And I would encourage you not to uh, decide early in your career that you're going to be one of the people who just observes or you're going to be one of the people who just builds. You got to, well, you don't have to, but I encourage you to do both. Uh, I think there's great power in trying to do both. OK, so that, that concludes the, the background and my generic advice for you as, as, uh, as budding scholars. I want to get into the, the, um, the topic domain here, which is uh, social nudges for health behavior change. Uh, I want to start by just pointing out, in terms of national priorities, we have an obesity epidemic. And uh, you've probably heard that term. Maybe you've seen controversy about, about uh, the, uh, uh, what's the study saying that obesity is contagious? I, 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 don't, I, I don't really, I'm not sure that, it, that epidemic is quite the word, but, um, but uh, obesity is on the rise in the United States, and there's, uh, it's very costly. It's costly in, in terms of heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, shorter lives, lower quality of life. And it's uh, costly in economic terms. An average, uh, this of course is estimate, of $1,429 a year in healthcare costs per person, per year, uh, and that's averaged over overall people. Uh, so that's, that's a big, big effect. It is, uh, it is a growing problem in, in the United States. Uh, this is a graph from, from 1985. Uh, this is by state the percentage of the population who have a body mass index or BMI of greater than 30. So to just calibrate that a little bit, that would be somebody who, if, you, if they were five feet four, they're about 30 pounds overweight. And you see that it's not equally distributed across the country. My uh, home state of Michigan was, has no data for that year. That year, okay, so we don't know how they were doing. But uh, you know, you've got uh, Ohio with more than 10%, uh, sorry, with 10 to 15%, whereas uh, you've got less than 10% in some other states. Nowhere above 15. What's that? And no, nowhere more than 15%, nowhere that provided data. Well, 1986, you can see um, a few more states are providing data. 
A couple more are turning blue, uh, are turning dark blue here. We get to 1987, 1988. Uh, we're filling in 1989. And some of those that were light blue are now turning dark blue. So this is 1990. Uh, many states are in the 10 to 14 percent range. Shortly after 1991, uh, we start to have uh, an additional color introduced. Um, this is the 15 to 19 percent, and my state of Michigan is, is there. And we start filling in. By 1993, we've got data from almost every state. Uh, and we've got a lot more dark blues. 1994, it's, it's getting to be more dark blues. Uh, half, the, half the states are over 15% by 1995. 1996, uh, we have to introduce another color in 1997 for the greater than 20%. And uh, Michigan goes into that category in 1998. Almost half the country is in this new color by 1999. In 2000, even more. We have to have another new color in 2001 for, yeah, you want me to stop? I can't stop. I got to keep going. 2001, 2002, more states are getting this red color. More and more states by 2004. Oh, we have to have yet another color in 2005 for, for the 25 to 30 percent. Okay, and then uh, we're going to see a bunch of states get that by 2009. But, okay, well, we do have to stop here. I don't have data after, after 2010. But uh, we, it's probably gotten a lot better, though. It's probably gotten a lot better in the last couple of years because I started doing research in this area, and it's been really very effective. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask a considerable question about the actual data. In terms of how it was reported over time, does that influence how this graph here developed? Could be. I, I have not investigated how good this data is, it, but it's coming. It's coming from um, coming from uh, Center for Disease Control website. So it's it's at least not completely made up. But it could be that the methodology changed over time. On the other hand, you're seeing such a continuous change. It's not like it goes like this for a while and then suddenly it switches, which would suggest a methodological change. When you see it changing every year, it suggests. It probably is a real uh, thing. I can further back you up on the medical side. I don't know a single physician who disputes these numbers. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to comment about the graphic. I mean, it's, it's really a relatively simple display, but boy, does that have an impact. I yeah. Mean, you should go through that. Yeah, wow. it really does. And, and from beginning to end, remember, at the beginning, we had some states that were in the yeah. 10 to 14, and some less than 10, and then some that we didn't have any data for. And at the end, there's no state that's, that's less than 15. And yeah. half of them are more than 25. So big, big increase. All right, so this, this is, uh, given the human cost, the economic costs, and the, problem, and the fact it's a really growing problem, this would, be a reasonable, this would be a reasonable national priority to say, is there something we can do about it? Now, there are lots of reasons why people are obese. Some of them have to do with environmental factors. Some of them have to do with changes in availability of different kinds of food. Some of them have to do with individual genetics. There's lots of things going on. But there are many people uh, who are uh, trying to control their weight. Uh, the, it's actually a pretty, except for you know, a, a few cases where there are genetic things going on, it, it's really a, a simple matter of arithmetic. You have to have fewer calories going in than there are getting burned if you want to bring weight down. Uh, and uh, I have chosen to focus uh, on the getting people to be more active part. Uh, I got into this through, through my wife, who's a physician and, and who was already doing some, some work on this, uh, doing um, pedometer-based interventions where she gives people pedometers. Uh, this one is a, a Fitbit. It's kind of cute because it's small and has a color on it. And, and uh, it's also nice because uh, when you walk near a computer that has the uploader on it, it does the upload. So you don't have to actually take it out and attach a wire. Uh, I got interested in how could we supercharge the kind of intervention she was doing by adding social elements. So uh, 
I, I'm gonna I'm gonna intersperse a little bit of some of the things that I've done with her and that are ongoing with some things that I've noticed <clears throat> that are just apps that are out there. Uh, starting last fall, I started a, a blog that it, uh, chronicles some commercial apps that are out there, some research, uh, some, some theory. Uh, it's called healthiertogether.info. The, the theme of it is where co does connection and data from other people help, um, help people to be healthier. So um, I've had a number of collaborators on this research. Uh, Carolyn Richardson, who's uh, my wife and is a physician. Mark Newman, who's another HDI faculty member at Michigan. Margie Morris at Intel. Aaron Krepka, who's a, an, a behavioral economist at Michigan. And uh, Sean Munson, who's a PhD, actually a PhD, uh, and is uh, on his way off to University of Washington as a faculty member this fall. And Deborah Lauterbach, who is a who was a master's student and is now at Google. I want to start by, I'm going to, as I said, I'm going to intersperse some of the things that are uh, my research with uh, just other products that are out there. Uh, I want to start by talking about self-tracking. You heard a little bit of reference to it this morning uh, with the, uh, the you know, analysis of when do people want to be tracked and, and, and how do you bring values into, into the design of tracking systems. How many of you have heard of the quantified self movement? Okay, good. So these are people who are quantifying themselves. Things like how much sleep did they get last night and making graphs of that. There's a, the Zio product that uh, is a sleep monitor, but you can also get the Sleep Cycle app on your iPhone and various other ways of tracking your sleep. Physical activity I mentioned. Here's the things from the Fitbit site with these bar graphs showing how many steps I walked on different days. Um, tracking food. Uh, this is something, this is an app um, where people are supposed to, it's called the eatery. You're supposed to take a, a photo of um, everything you eat and other people then uh, rate it and tell you how healthy it was. Um, turns out that looking at other people's pictures and rating it is this somehow a fun activity? People like doing that. Uh, so for every for every science. yeah, citizen science. Uh, for every uh, thing that people post there, there's like seven or eight uh, ratings of it by other people. So it, apparently, it's more fun to to rate other people's food than to, to actually upload yours. I also discovered, to my chagrin, after I like you know I just download and test a bunch of these things, but many of them I don't continue using. Um, that. Uh, that uh, you're really supposed to take a picture of it before you eat it. <laughs> and I have this like awful photo of my you know, chicken carcass after I <laughs> ate, ate the piece of chicken. And everybody gave it a low rating, even though it was pretty healthy, because it looked so horrible. Anyway. <laughs> Mood tracking. Uh, on the left is an app called Moody Me. On the right is one called uh, One Recovery, which is part of a, uh, an app for uh, people who are re recovering alcoholics. Um, these are things where you're, you can, at various times of day, say, I'm happy now or not. Or on the right, you know, lots of, lots of different, um, different adjectives you can use. But they, they reduce to good and bad, yellow and red. And uh, when it's red, uh, uh, your support team calls you to make sure that you're not going to have a drink. A bunch of these things have, have added some form of gamification, and there's you know, lots of, of vendors out there who are adding something on top where you get some kind of points, you get some kind of badges, maybe you get prizes a after, you, after, you, uh, after you do them. And I want to encourage us to think for a little bit about, rather than having these be individual activities, what do we get when there's some amount of sharing? And there's three kinds of things that it, it can help for. One is social support. That is, I'm not alone in this. There are other people who are dealing with the problem I'm dealing with. Uh, there are other people who, are, who, who know what I'm going through. Uh, there's, it can be helpful for decision making. You get sites like uh, Patients Like Me where people are sharing, uh, here's the vitamins I tried and they did or didn't help with my, with my condition. But I want to focus on a third category, which is things that nudge us, help us to be our, the person we wanted to be, that help us to 
change the behavior that we wanted to change. And I think there's a few ways that, it, that other people can help us to do that. One is to make the activity, which might not be so fun, to be a little bit more fun. So uh, here's a little bit of, of data from, um, from essentially a corporate wellness program, except it happens to be the University of Michigan wellness program. They, they, they ran something where everybody can sign up and you go to a website and, and input how many minutes of gardening or walking or swimming or whatever activity you've done. Um, and uh, you do this for the course of eight weeks and you can either sign up as an individual or you can sign up as part of a team. Uh, and that team can be you know, all the students in a Actually, it wasn't undergrads, but it can be all the students in your department. It can be your, your co-workers. It can be uh, you know, any, any group of people that gets together. Some people sign up alone. Some people sign up in proto-teams that only have a, a couple people in them. And other people sign up in bigger teams. And what we're charting here is over the course of eight weeks, what's the probability uh, that this person enters data in that week? And of course, as you might expect, over time it goes down a little bit. People are more excited about this program at the beginning than they are at the end. But you can see that uh, there's four of these lines that are basically indistinguishable up at the top, and then there's the ones down below. The ones at the top are all the big teams, five or more people. The ones at the bottom are the individuals and proto teams. So just participating in this and, and you, you get no, you don't get to see uh, how much data or, you know, how, many, how much exercise any of the people on your team did. You do get to see some, um, some team standings. So there's a little team competition that's going on. And uh, that plus perhaps just the camaraderie of being on a team seems to be enough to, uh, to, to make that, that difference. Um, yeah. What's that? Um, I was just doing the multiplication in my head. It looks like um, there's about a 60%, 40% chance that you do it by yourself. So that means in the first week and about 30% in the last week, right. something like that, yeah. So in a team of two, uh, if it were independent, then at least one person would do it about 60% of the time, which then might nudge the other person. Perhaps. Uh, although they, uh, you know, anyway, we don't, we don't know the nature of this mechanism. In fact, I'm going to talk caveats later, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a selection effect going on as well, that uh, certain people are more likely to join a team. And it may be that the people who are more likely to join a team are more likely to stick with it rather than the team causing it. So we, this is not a controlled experiment. This is a natural experiment, and we can't necessarily be sure about the causation. Were they self-selected or assigned? This is all self-selected. You can join as a team, you can sign up as an individual. So you don't assign books. What's that? You don't These assign are not books assigned. Okay. okay. Another thing, uh, another example of making the behavior social as a way to, to make uh, people be more motivated. So taking a walk together, generally more fun than taking a walk alone. Uh, I uh, picked up an app uh, called, um, uh, I can't remember what it's called here, but uh, it, it turns it into a little treasure hunt. So you walk around, somebody has gone around uh, and made some waypoints that say, uh, when you get to that waypoint, uh, on your phone it pops up and, and asks you a question that you can only answer if you're at that spot. Like, what's the text above the building or something like that. And that gets you to, to take a little tour and, uh, uh, at least anecdotally from the people who created this app, uh, it's the fact that somebody in your family or one of your friends created the tour makes it kind of more interesting to be taking the tour. It's also, how many of you have ever done geocaching? Okay, so this is a thing where you go around with your GPS and you find a cache somewhere in Washington, D.C. Uh, that someone's left, left something there and uh, you have some cryptic clue and you've got to go find it uh, using the, the GPS coordinates. And then when you find it, you leave a little note that you found it and leave something online. So that's another thing that sort of makes it a little bit social to get out and about. Making the tracking social, that is, uh, people sign up for some kind of walking program, uh, just letting them talk to each other, 
as part of that program turned out to be something that that caused um, that caused people to uh, stick with the program more. So uh, Caroline uh, had been, you know, giving people pedometers, not this one actually, Omron pedometers, and doing these uh, this program where they can go online and see a history of their steps. Uh, they get some motivational motivational messaging, things like that, and uh, we we asked the question, would it make a difference if the people who were enrolled in the study could talk to each other? And uh, so for some of the people, they got this area down at the bottom with basically forums. And uh, here we do have random assignment. So people sign up, and uh, a small subset of them uh, got no interaction with other uh, with other participants, and the rest of them got uh, to be part of the forums. And in fact, we see a pretty uh, big difference in, in completion rates. And uh, for both groups, if they complete, they uh, increase their step counts quite a bit. So you can think of 66 to 79 percent. I like to flip it and think about uh, what percentage dropped out. 34 percent dropped out from the individual tracking only, or, whereas only 21 percent are dropping out. So it's, it's almost cutting in half the, the dropout rate. A pretty, pretty big effect there. All right, so those are things about either making the, the activity itself something that you do with other people or making the, the tracking something that you do with other people. Uh, I think other people can also make the activity more rewarding, not just through their presence, but through what they do. For example, um, there's an app for runners uh, Nike Plus, I've got it on my iPhone, I started running last year, and, uh, and you can use it, you know, you listen to, to songs while you're going and it keeps track of where you've run. Uh, but they also have this feature called Cheers, so if you integrate it with Facebook and when you start running, you say, I'm, I'm running now, it makes a post to Facebook saying that you're running. Uh, and if, if one of your friends clicks the like button while you're still running, it interrupts your, your your audio and and you hear cheering, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. I apparently don't have enough friends who who were who were interested. I had to I had to go out of my way to I, said, I told someone I'm going running now. Could you you know click the like button while I'm running? So I got I got to hear it. It didn't have quite the same motivational effect of of uh, but uh, yeah, it wasn't quite spontaneous. And of course this I, I don't I don't use it anymore because. I don't think my Facebook friends want to know every time I'm going running. Maybe they want to know about what I had for breakfast, but going <laughs> running is not quite as interesting for them. So there's, there's some things that need to be worked out with this model, but, but I think uh, you know, there's, there's possibilities there for encouragement, and of course it, it need not be real time. I think there's another potential, and here this is a study that we have a design for, that we, we don't have funding for yet. The idea that is that helping others may be more motivating than having other people help you. So uh, you see people do the cancer walk or things like that, and you know they might not have walked 20 miles that day, but they'll walk 20 miles that day because they're raising money for, for a charity. Uh, uh, so we have this design uh, where there's basically an incentive for meeting your walking goal, uh, but uh, we're going to vary in the different conditions. Some of the people uh, will get a gift card if they meet their walking goal. Other people, their friend will get a gift card if they meet their walking goal, and some people it'll be split between them. Uh, this was inspired by a by a study that a uh, that Sinan Aral did uh, at the at the NYU Business School, where, around uh, trying to do viral product uh, recommendations, where they they uh, tested uh, you can either send a coupon to your friend. Or you can uh, send a, uh, you know, a suggestion to your friend, please buy this product, and when you do, I'll get some money, uh, or, or some split between. And uh, they, were, they got a lot more people to do the referrals when the friend was going to get some money than when the, they themselves were going to get the money. And it was actually most effective when it was, when it was split. So I think, I think there's a lot of opportunities that are not yet exploited for uh, motivating people by attaching incentives that don't go to them but they go to, to their friends. Another thing that other people can do is create accountability. I think this is the first thing we think of when we think of other people uh, and, and behavior change. So at the eatery, 
you take the picture and other people say uh, that ice cream maybe wasn't so, so good or, or, or it was. So feedback from others can create accountability. I mentioned with one recovery where, uh, where your uh, support network actually calls you uh, when you say that you're uh, angry or, or depressed. How many of you have seen stick.com or heard about it? So this is uh, something that tries to use financial incentives. Uh, stick as in stick to something and the extra K is a contract. So I took a contract out on myself last November. I've, I have a long-term behavior change problem of not stretching. And it actually um, it's harms my life. I get pain, I get inability to do things that I would like to be able to do because I'm not flexible enough. Uh, but I can't, haven't been able to get myself to do it. Except I did manage to do it, uh, you'll hear the story. So I signed up, they let you take out a contract. I took out a contract, I will stretch six days out of seven every week for the next 12 weeks. <laughs> and any week that I don't meet that seven days, uh, meet, meet the six out of seven, I have to pay $25. <laughs> but $25 wasn't that much, so I, I figured I'd better turn, turn the screws here. Any time I didn't do it, I had to pay $25 to support an organization that, um, that does political work against gay marriage. <laughs> I support gay marriage. <laughs> so I took a contract out on myself and I did, I mean, I could afford to lose the $25. I can't afford the psychological feelings. I think that, I mean, I think that group really hurts people. Uh, so I, I didn't, didn't want to be in the position of giving them money. I, I stretched seven days out of seven for 12 weeks. And I'm re just realizing I need to take out another contract because I'm <laughs> off, the, off the way. Um, but the interesting thing is, unlike the pedometer, which is going to count whether I did my steps or not, I could lie about whether I, um, whether I do my stretching or not. And this is actually a problem with these commitment contracts, that in advance I would like to be held to the contract because I want it to have an incentive effect. But after I fail to meet my commitment, <laughs> I kind of want to be let out of the contract because I don't want to actually give the money to the organization <laughs> that I hate. Uh, and so I thought, well, I'll solve that problem. Actually, Stick encourages this. You can designate an external monitor. So uh, in this case, I, had, uh, I designated my wife as, as the monitor. So she's the one who, who has to report whether I made it or not. Uh, and you didn't tell her the contract. Well, that, that was the, that's the, so she actually, you know, lives close enough to me uh, <laughs> that, that she could tell whether I stretched before I came to bed or not. Um, but uh, I did tell her the contract, and she, and she said right up front, I'm never going to report that you didn't do it. Uh, so I had to cancel her <laughs> as the monitor and go back to, to self-monitoring. So, uh, but I do, think, I do think the possibility of other people as monitors is a way that we can, we can make these commitment contracts uh, work better. Uh, because if you find the right person who really understands what the purpose of it is, and they just say, look, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you to it, because that's what you wanted originally, and, and you know I'm going to do it. So, uh, so I, I think we, we could get uh, other people to do that for us. But I think we can also take the stick model and think about, instead of having financial penalties, thinking about having social penalties. We'll think about social punishment. Uh, this is something that, that we, have, uh, we have played around with and are, and are now about to, we're now designing a controlled experiment that we, that we do have funding for. I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. But here's the feature, which is I make a commitment for something I'm going to do next week. I'm going to walk at least 40,000 steps, or I'm going I'm to meet my daily target at least five days, uh, something like that. And when I make the commitment, I author two messages, one of which will get posted. The one, either the success message or the failure message will get posted, depending on. So I'm, this is self-blackmail, right? Uh, so I uh, post to my newsfeed that I didn't keep my commitment. If I were using this, uh, this is a fight I've had with 
with, with Sean Munson. I, I wanted to make the suggested text be, you know, I'm a loser, uh, I can't be trusted, <laughs> something that I really wouldn't want to have posted. And, and he said, oh, no, that's going to be too icky for people. and No one will, no one will like it. So we, but you can author whatever you want. We, our suggestion is darn. Uh, and you, you do that, and then, uh, then it'll, it'll uh, post it to Facebook for you. Now, we've actually, uh, we've actually designed an experiment here. We're, we're still in the, in the design phase, but I want to I make a little detour and uh, make an encouragement for those of you who are uh, doing experiments of any uh, conventional, old-style experiments. If you go to Facebook as an intern for the summer and you're going to have 10,000 people in your experiment, you don't need to worry about this. But for the rest of us, we're going to have 20, 100, 200 people in your experiment. Uh, we, uh, we do not emphasize enough to graduate students the need to do power analyses. Uh, and let me, I, I have become a real, I've sort of said to my students over the years, it w you should do one. But then they wouldn't do it, and, and I wouldn't make them. And this time, I've, I actually did it and found, oh my god, our design is not going to work. We do not have enough subjects, and we couldn't possibly afford the number of subjects we would need. So let me, let me explain a little bit about this. So we're, we're going to run this experiment. We're going to recruit uh, people who are, have BMI over 30 to be uh, participants in this study. We're going to give them pedometers, and we're going to assign them into one of four conditions in a two-by-two two design. Some of them are going to make their commitments to the, to the computer, and only they're going to see the commitments, and they're going to see the results. Some of the people are going to have their commitments and, their re and or their results announced to their Facebook friends and by email to three people that they designate. Now, there's, it turns out uh, there's, there's some theory saying that public commitments are not always a good idea in terms of motivating people. But you would think, you know, I make a commitment that I'm going to, I tell you now, for the next three months, I'm going to stretch every day, that that should increase my probability of doing that. Um, but in fact, none of you will be able to check up on me. And so uh, it may not be so effective. And in fact, there's uh, one set of studies that finds it actually has a negative effect for some kind uh, in, in this experiment that, that people who made a public commitment were less likely to keep the commitment than if they kept their commitment private. The explanation he gives is that, uh, that once you make the uh, public commitment, you actually get a lot of the social rewards that you were going to get. And you don't have to actually do the activity in order to, to get those social rewards. So, so we, that sort of, you can see why that would motivate this design. We're going to try to see if, if you add the public accountability for the results, whether that means you now can't get those social benefits unless you carry out your, your commitment. So this is, our, this is our design. This is what's called a between subjects design. Every subject is in one of the four conditions, and we're going to compare, uh, we're going to compare between the conditions. Uh, I'm sorry. Those are the, that was the uh, conditions. Our first design was a between subjects design. Each subject is randomly designed, assigned to one of those conditions. They stay in that condition for 14 weeks, and we analyze, do the people in one condition walk more than people in, in the other conditions? So I wanted to see whether the, uh, and we have a budget for a certain number of Fitbits, if we did that design, uh, were we going to have a reasonable chance of getting a statistically significant difference between the groups? And it turns out, running a power analysis by simulation, I always used to think this was something you had to do closed form mathematics and only only very simple designs could you, could you do it. And I, I, I've recently discovered, gosh, running a, running a simulation is really easy. It took less than 100 lines of code. Uh, so, so I'm basically going to fake running this experiment k times, each time having a total of n subjects. And what do I mean by fake it? Well, I assume that, there's, that the people who are in the public condition are going to have step counts drawn from one distribution, and the people who are in the private condition are, have step counts drawn from the other distribution, and you know, there's some overlap between those distributions. What's the, uh, and then, so I generate fake results that way and see whether with 30 people in each condition, do I get a statistically significant uh, result 
on this fake experiment, and then I run that fake experiment a thousand times, and I see what percentage of the time does this fake experiment give me a statistically significant result. So that's power analysis. I'm sure in, in your statistics class it was referred to, but how many of you have how many of you have conducted an experiment before? How many of you did a power analysis before you did the experiment? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. Well, good for you. I, I can't say that I always did. Um, there are also websites that will do it. Like yeah. you said, for the design you had, you right. could easily find a website that would. Yeah, that's quite good. Uh, actually, it turns out not probably not for mine because I had to do uh, a mixed mixed model logit, and I don't I don't think they're doing that. But anyway, um, so. Uh, yeah, if you have a very standard design, you may be able to do that. If you don't, you can still do it. Turns out not to be that hard. Uh, and with our power analysis, we found we were gonna that even if we had 90 su subjects per condition, you know, obviously I'm making some assumptions about how big the effect is. That wasn't going to be enough. Uh, I'm I, I'm covering up a lot of uh, differences here. I'm, I, my outcome variable actually wasn't step counts, but how many days you you made the the target that, that we gave you. Uh, but but it, it turns out that actually you need a lot of subjects to have to have decent power in between subjects designs and this is one of the things that uh, you know I, I'm just reading Danny Kahneman's book Thinking Fast and Slow and he's sort of going back through you know his history of biases in judgment and decision making and um, experimental psychologists routinely underestimate how many subjects they need in order to have have sufficient uh, statistical power. So uh, that's, this has caused us to switch to a partially within subjects design, where instead of having uh, a between subject comparison, we have every subject uh, for a few weeks do a baseline where they, uh, where they don't make any commitment at all. Uh, they just, we just see, uh, um, you know, just see how, how they walk. Uh, and then we're going to compare among the conditions the change from baseline for each individual. So if you have one individual who's walking a lot more than somebody else, that's going to get washed out because it's the changes that we'll, we'll be noticing. You should probably leave uh, group as a control and no commitment to see if people walk more over time just by themselves. We're having, we're having, a, we're having a lot of arguments in the group. Uh, one of one of my colleagues wants to do that. I actually don't think that's right. Uh, you want to know what the su you want to know what his suggestion was. He was saying we should have um, we should have a baseline group that that keeps going. Uh, that would allow us to tell uh, whether having any commitment was different from having no commitment. But what we're trying to test is whether having public commitment is different from having private commitment. So we could talk more. Uh, I have been unable to convince my colleague, but I'm I'm uh, pretty certain that this is that you don't want to do that. I mean, we, unless you want to have some extra subjects and you also want to test the difference between commitments and no commitments. Let me. I know I'm getting uh, near the end here, so um, that I did I did a long detour there about uh, about the the power analysis. It's on my mind recently, so that's, that's partly why, but also I think it's something that we don't do, do enough of when we're doing experiments. I, I want to come back to some of the substantive things. I've been making a case that if we want to help people make behavior changes, and for me it's particularly behavior change about physical activity, uh, that, that we can draw on other people for accountability, for support, for encouragement, for making the activities fun. Um, but there are some problems. It's not, it's not all easy to do this. One is uh, that some of the sharing is embarrassing to people and they don't want to do it. <laughs> Especially they don't want to do it on Facebook. Uh, and I won't read these, but uh, you can see. Uh, Especially on Facebook, actually, it turns out that on their, you know, on Spark people, they'll they'll sell, they'll share everything, but they don't want to. They, they're embarrassed to share with their Facebook friends. Um, there are even more 
worried, and this, was, this one was a, a little surprise to us, they're, they're actually less worried about embarrassing than boring uh, their friends. Um, you know, I don't, I, don't think every, I don't think everybody wants to know every time I take a run. And, uh, you know, other people are probably correctly think that all their friends don't want to know what their daily weigh-in is or, or how, what their daily step count is. There are also uh, issues, I, mean, I didn't talk very much uh, here about the use of leaderboards and competition, but that's another way that we can get motivation from other people. But not everybody likes those, um, especially for people who, who have uh, low self-efficacy for the activity. They're worried that they're not going to be able to do it. They, they are probably not going to like the prospect of, of competition. In that, in that uh, study where I was saying what's the difference between being on a team and not being on a team, people self-selected whether to be on a team and we found that uh, people who were heavier were less likely to join a team. So there's, there, there are some issues to, to deal with there. Um, there, there are some interesting studies in, uh, in economics. Lise Vesterland uh, found that in, uh, not in this physical activity setting, but in these sort of lab studies, uh, women were less likely to choose to compete than men, even when their abilities were the same. So they had a, an experimental setup where they, they created different ability levels, and they, they made it so that they, they had, uh, you know, it was an artificial, t artificial task, and they made it so that they would have the same ability to complete the task, and uh, women were less likely to choose to compete even when their abilities were the same. They were more likely to choose a non-competitive option where they got piece rate pay for their work. So there are gender effects, there may be self-efficacy differences. We need to think carefully about when to in introduce uh, comparisons and competition. The other is that if we're, I haven't talked as much about other people as sources of social support, but they aren't always sources of social support. Sometimes they are social drags. And uh, I was really struck uh, looking on, there's a, a diet and exercise site called Spark People where people share more anonymously but share everything. Their daily weigh-ins and, and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and they say things like, I'd much rather share on Spark people because the people in my real life aren't supportive. They'll say things like, oh, are you counting calories? That won't work. You should do the thing that I did instead. You should, you should get a pedometer instead. Counting calories will never work. So that's, that's one unhelpful response. Or the sabotage. Oh, come on, it's a birthday party. You can have one piece of cake. <laughs> or the seemingly helpful, hey, you know, don't, work, don't be so concerned with your body image. You're fine the way you are. Your husband loves you anyway. Why are you putting yourself through this? May be reasonable, but the, the person who's heard it doesn't experience it as reasonable. They experience it as, as unsupportive. Uh, whereas, interestingly, uh, at least, of course, this is highly selective, high, highly, uh, highly biased. The people who are still on Spark People are saying Spark People is great. Uh, and, but, 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 it's, but it is pretty remarkable. Uh, the, the kind of the love fest they have there. Oh, everybody on Spark People is great. None of you ever do these unhelpful responses. All right, so to summarize, um, I think there are benefits of tracking together. There are a lot of possibilities for supporting be, uh, health behavior change. Uh, I, have, I talk less about support and decision making, uh, but, but I think those are also ways that other people can, can help us. Uh, I think there's some critical design challenges around sharing the right stuff with the right people and matching the social elements to the individual needs. Give the competitive aspects to the people who are going to benefit from it, but not to others. I want to remind you of, since I've mostly focused on, on these, I do want to remind you of, of some of that advice uh, as you pursue your careers, which is uh, if you're going into a new field, don't just read the literature, find somebody who's going to be your guide. Uh, Choose, choose somebody who's good. Um, make sure that you, you're bringing something to the table so that they'll want to collaborate with you. Uh, go deep in the fields that you cross into. That is, learn from your, from your collaborators. Uh, learn math and programming while you're in grad school and still have the time. Uh, and uh, take this change perspective, the designer's perspective. If you want to understand the world, 
try to change it. Thank you. Yes. First, I think it's really, really great stuff. Um, one thing, have you heard about Jim Pact? Jim Pact. Is that the one where, uh, where uh, the, everybody puts in 50 bucks and the people who, who keep the pact get, get the money and the people who don't uh, lose um, the money? Similar concept. So you sign up, when you sign up for a gym for a year or whatever, gym membership, you say how many days a week you will go there. Oh, and you have to check, check in with your iPhone. So it's not just you say I, you were there, but you actually have to be there for at least 30 minutes <laughs> to really make a count. And every time you don't go, you pay $10 into, a, into the pool. And the people who did go, they yeah. split these, these $10 payments. So you can, can make some extra money and, and lose quite a lot. And lose quite a lot. <laughs> so, so it's a very, very similar approach. Yeah, so instead of giving the money to the anti-charity, you go into one of these pools. It has, it has the additional advantage that uh, when you sign up, you not only think, uh, I'm not going to lose any money, because you know you're going to keep your commitment, but you actually think, I have an expected gain, because unlike me, who has so, so much self-control, everybody else doesn't, and so I'm going to get some of their money. So it, the in expectation, you, of course you're wrong, but you think that, that, you're, going, that you're going to earn money, and uh, yeah, so I think that it's a way of amplifying it um, potentially. Especially, I think if, if you do it with a, with a few buddies, that may also introduce the social accountability element. Yeah, in the back. Um, in addition to when you do an intervention, do they walk more or not, or walk less? Uh, there's another aspect of exercise that doesn't come up too often, which is how hard does it feel? Because it turns out independent of how many calories you're actually doing it. Uh, do you have any clue from what you get this way as to whether a, how did it feel, or how much did you like this from makes a difference? Yeah, um, I, I don't know as, as much about that. If Caroline was here, she'd be able to give you a better answer. I can, I can you know, quote to you the, the interesting quotes I've heard her say at the dinner table over, over time. One of them is that, uh, uh, People who start walking programs because they want to lose weight or because they want to lose inches around their waist uh, don't are, uh, get demotivated pretty quickly because walking programs actually take a very long time, like years, to, to help with, with weight loss. Uh, but uh, those people who do it to reduce stress, to feel better, uh, have a better time sticking with it. So I'm not sure if it's exactly getting it at, at your question, but I, I, I think things that help people reflect uh, on, gee, uh, have you noticed that your mood was better on those days when you walked? Because they may not realize that it actually works for self redu stress reduction and, and, and feeling better. And sort of helping them realize that may be a really effective way to, to, to keep people motivated. I, I, it would be nice to know, is it easier to take a walk now than it was a month ago? Maybe you're suggesting that kind of, that kind of question. I don't think we have, have that. I guess I would like to have maybe some kind of experience sampling rather than just beginning and end if, if we were going to do that. Jenny. Um, Paul, your, your work is fabulous, but if you have um, more PhD students coming along, I wonder if there is a, an interesting project that involves people with obesity with possibly lower incomes. Because when we talk about gym and when we talk about all the kinds of apps and technologies and stuff, mm -hmm. and yes. bets on yeah. money, etc., it kind of implies, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people who are moderately well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know this area terribly well, but I believe that there is some sort of strong correlation with income and obesity, whether it's to do with not having the money to buy the right sort of food, or whether it's to do with the relational share possibly between income and education, so not knowing what to, to eat. Um, so it's just a suggestion, as your many 
PhD students come through, that that might be a complementary area that might be a really important one to have an impact on this big area. I mean, the slides at the beginning are just like shocking as you show them. Uh, yeah, uh, speaking of, you know, PhD students and, and uh, the next ones, uh, you know, send your great undergraduates because uh, I, I have Sean who's graduated and, and Daniel Joe who's uh, graduating and, and Siddharth who's, who's here, but Siddharth is working on uh, our politics work, not the health work. So actually, yeah, uh, this is all happening with staff now, not with, not with PhD students. Uh, so um, it would be great if you uh, could, yeah. could send us some. I mean, it's kind of a plea for this other part of, you know, dealing with obesity in this other area of, you know, what the, what the Yeah, okay, so to, substantively, to, to take it there, uh, your intuition is that, is that some of these things, you know, won't work with, with or, or will work better or worse with, with different populations. And, and that's, that's certainly true. Yeah, I, I actually, my intuition about the effect of financial incentives is that it'll be much more effective, you know, the less income that people have, the more effective a smaller a smaller financial incentive is, yeah. uh, but uh, but it may be that you know recruiting people to participate is maybe more or less difficult. It's more getting at the relationship between you know income extras uh, income and knowledge versus income and ability to buy the food and what you can do with this. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. actually a research project at the EU on low income obesity and oh. how HCI can help. Do you, did everybody hear that? He's saying there's a there's a project at Colorado on uh, lower income people and obesity and how and, and how technology can help or oh, HCI. or how HCI, HCI can help. Yes. Actually, having been in um, many weight loss programs, uh, I I realized um, and I was in one in Michigan recently, so it's very near and dear to my heart. But um, the reasons that like my reasons for not being able to lose weight and especially those who were of lower income were extremely different and especially um, among the older f older people they had no knowledge of nutrition um, mm -hmm. in yeah. general and it was just so shocking how little they knew about what was actually a proper meal and what kind of or the concept of calories or the concept of how intake and out, you know, it, the balance, it, they were just like fascinated by that. So I, I definitely agree with Jenny that there may be a, um, a large um, income or um, maybe education of the difference. I will say that these pedometer programs, I mean, my wife has used them with a number of populations, including uh, VA, the Veterans Administration, and that is a, that is a lower income population because uh, the, the veterans who, who have good jobs and health insurance are for the most part not using the VA. Uh, but uh, they've, they've had success with, with those groups. They've had success with uh, patients with, with uh, 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 you know, various kinds of diseases, diabetes, uh, mental health. Um, so it, it does seem to, it, it, isn't, it isn't the case that the walking programs don't work for for uh, for disadvantaged populations, uh, but it may be that particular elements of uh, of it uh, will or won't work better. Um, one thing that I found personally, and I don't know if I'm just weird, but, but what I found when I try to lose weight is that uh, when I start up an exercise program, there's an initial actually weight gain. And I think it may have something to do with muscle or something. And it's, it's, I have to make myself overcome that, okay, I, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to gain the weight because I'm actually healthier, even though my weight has increased. And so that's always been a hard part for me is just going, okay, that's all right to gain a little bit. Right. And that may be, you know, something where having the right mental model Makes makes a huge difference. I will say that you know again I, I leave the the medical parts to, to Caroline to some extent, but but uh, I, you know I've noticed that she is very careful in these programs that these are physical activity programs. These are not weight loss programs. 
She never asks people to weigh in. She doesn't measure weight at the beginning and the end. None of the tips are about, uh, about weight loss. It's about activity and how to deal with your ankle hurting and, and that kind of stuff. So to me, a lot of what's interesting about looking at self-tracking and social self-tracking is the idea that people are being kind of self-motivated or peer-motivated to change. And it's a sort of like horizontal authority, horizontal surveillance reinforcement. And I'm just wondering, when you're studying that and coming into it as a researcher and saying, well, here, take this Fitbit, do this thing, participate in this thing, is there sort of an implicit way in which you're taking the role of an authority and therefore it's not as like, sure the horizontal as you might think. Is there a way to observe that in a way as researchers where we don't cast ourselves as authority and sort of tweak the system? Yeah, so uh, the experimenter effect of people do things to because they think the experimenter wants it. Um, those are great concerns. The approach that we generally take, rather than trying to have some control that doesn't involve yeah. the experimenter, is that as we try to build in the same experimenter demand effect uh, for all the conditions, and then you compare across conditions. So you have some control condition that's inside the experiment, where people are, yeah, okay, I know you gave me the, the pedometer, I guess that means I should walk more but then we'll compare between the people who have, who have one ver versus another. And we're very concerned about, uh, you know, unlike a conventional medical trial where you have a placebo control and people don't know whether they're in the placebo condition or the, or the treatment condition, it's a sugar pill or, or it's an active pill and supposedly they don't know. Uh, in, in these things, we have to do something special. We actually have to hide a little bit of what it is we're testing. <coughs> So we're, we're you know, going through all our instructions and saying this is, a, this is about uh, the effect of commitments. On, we don't say it's about public versus private because if we did, people would realize, hey, they're testing public commitments and I'm in the private version. That means I should, you know, they don't want me to do well or, or whatever. So, <laughs> so it, it, does, it does have, it does have uh, implications for the design that you do have to, to try to have the same level of experimental demand for all of the... It just seems like the event should be this way is going to be much larger than <coughs> people participating. But it seems like if you come at it from just an observation standpoint, you have to obviously have a much smaller observed group of people once you're up inside the group of people who are fit or whatever. But I'm wondering, is there a way to do that on a large scale too, such that you can have a different perspective on it? Hmm. Possibly. My, my, my take on it is that you should do those kinds of things in order to form your theories and then, and then try to test this way. But you know, maybe there's some great methodological advance to be made of, of how you can test your theories uh, that way. It's hard for me to see how you, how you would do it, but that's, uh, that, would be, that would be a big contribution, sort of a meta contribution, if you could figure out how to do that. Yeah, I can't before I ask. No, I'm sorry, I can't either. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate it.